Sometimes we see what we think we should do and automatically we do it because that's what is built within us. That's the desire within us. But when God comes on the scene, he says, no, I don't want you to do it that way. I want you to do it this way. And, and we get sometimes confused because we think we know what's best for us. And sometimes we don't trust in what God wants for us. So sometimes when we think we should do something and we have the ability, we try something and over and over we fail. And that is what we're going to talk about today, about Jericho and how the Israelites did not defeat Jericho. The Israelites allowed God to defeat Jericho. And sometimes in our life, the parallel is sometimes we do not allow God to do the great things for us because we get in front of God and we don't listen to God. So the application is the Jericho, you just crossed over the Jordan. We just purified ourselves and we trusted in God and we followed the ark of God and we crossed over to Jordan and everything has been wonderful. But now, Jericho, a fortified city, one of the wonders of the world of the time. Mammoth in size. We walk up to this beautiful architectural city, walled up 30 foot tall, 30 feet deep. A wonderful city. And you look at that and say, that's my next object. And God tells Joshua, he says, I want you to do something. He said, I want you to just walk around Jericho. One time, each day for six days. And on that seventh day, I want you to walk around seven times. And when you walk around, I want you to, not to say a word. And the application would be very simply, if you have my personality... Well, instead of doing it in seven days, why don't we do it in three days? And if I walk two times for three days, I can get this whole battle done in three days. And I win some time. And I can do this. And God can understand because I'm hurrying up God's plan. And we can always change God's plan. But we can never get God's blessing if we change his plan. And here's what I believe God was trying to tell the army. I want you to see how big Jericho is. I want you to walk around that city 13 times, and I want you to be quiet, and I want you to see it is mammoth. I want you to see that you cannot win. I want you to see that Jericho is so enormous that if I do not show up, you will fail. Marched around that city, I could imagine the people on the walls were laughing, shooting arrows at them, mocking them, laughing at them. This army comes <laughs> walking around my city. I'm here for a battle. I'm here for a fight. What are you here with? What are you doing? We are relying on God. That's a step. That's a step that for 40 years they didn't do. For 40 years, they wandered in the wilderness. For 40 years, they were all by themselves allowing God to take care of them through manna. They were allowing God to feed them, to take care of them. But now God is saying, here is the time. Let me give you a quick review. The first point is, God demonstrates his power. When we trust in God, God demonstrates his power. And it started all the way back before they crossed the Jordan. He said this in chapter 3. Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves. For tomorrow, not you will do great things. The Lord will do amazing things among you. We have to get the mindset that if I can trust in God and I can do what God, God can do amazing things among you. Not necessarily with you. Not necessarily through you, but among you. And when we don't have to get the glory, and we know that we can trust in God, and we know that God has the ability to take a broken vessel that is not perfect, 
that has had mistakes. And if you purify yourself and you ask God to bless you, God can do amazing things among you. But sometimes we get to the point where God can't use me or we get to the point where God should use me. Why isn't God allowing me to do this? Why is somebody else doing it? We must humble ourselves, purify ourselves, and say, God, just use me. Just do whatever you want within me, and God can purify our hearts and move us to where he wants us to go. And he said this, after we purify ourselves, he said, I need you to do something that's very important. I need you to watch after the ark. And when that ark of God and the Levites carrying that ark and they touch that water, I am going to separate and I want you to keep the word of God, the ark of God, a thousand feet in front of you and I want your eyes intently on the ark of God because you haven't gone this way before and when you look after God, God will give you direction, peace and understanding. But if we get our eyes off of God's word and after God's will, what happens? We start looking at the circumstances and the surroundings and the muddy water and the problems of our life and we fail daily when we do not allow God to show and demonstrate his power within our lives. It is very important. When we do what God wants us to do, God can do great things within our life. Now, I think about one of the greatest illustrations in the, in the New Testament when, with Peter walking on the water. He saw Jesus walking on the water, coming up to him. And the storm was overwhelming. It was coming in, and, and Peter noticed it was Jesus. And he said, he said, Lord, if it is you, bid me that I can come unto you. And Jesus said, come. The only time that Peter stepped out of that boat and walked on that water is not because he was walking on water. It was he was in God's will because God, through Jesus, said, come. We can do the miraculous if we do it God's way. We can allow God to do great things through us if we do it the way God would have us to do it. And how we do that is follow after God's word. Keep it in front of us. Keep it well in front of us so we can see what it is doing. See what we are supposed to do. We have never gone this way before. Some of us are new to church. Some of us have no idea what the Bible even says. Some of us have no idea what God's will is for our lives. We must keep the word of God in front of us. We must hide it in our hearts. We must communicate about it. We must not just go to church and hope somebody talks about something. We must get into God's word, understand God's will, and keep it in front of us, keep it in front of our hearts and our minds. The second thing, God details his instructions. God details his instructions. Um, I thought this was really unique. It, it is for parents, it is for a church, it is for a lot of different things. But in Joshua chapter 4, I'm going to read, I'm going to read, if you mark this down, 1 through 3 and then verse 8 and then 20 through 24 of Joshua chapter 4. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, choose 12 men from among the people, one of each tribe, and tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, from the right where the priest stood, to carry them over with you and put them down in the place where I stay tonight. In verse 8, so the Israelites did Joshua commanded them. They took 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan according to the number of tribes of the Israelites as the Lord had told Joshua and they carried them over with them to their camp where they put them down. Now verses 20 through 24 this is key. And Joshua set up at Gilgal and the 12 stones they had taken out of the Jordan, he said to the Israelites, in the future, when your descendants ask their fathers, what do these stones mean? Tell them, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan just that he did in the Red Sea when he dried it up before until he had crossed over it. He did this that all the people on the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord. Here's what we do sometimes. Sometimes we forget what God wants us to do because we forget what God did for us in the past. I think there's times where we have to be able to communicate and put markers in our life 
and say, on this day, God did this. We need to write in our Bibles on June 21st, on March 23rd, on April 7th, I gave my life to Christ. God did something great and mighty within my life. God saved me. God changed me. God did something I've been praying for. We need to write it down, mark it down, so we can remember the very hand of God. Sometimes in our life, life happens. We get busy and we forget the hand of God. We can look back 10, 15, 20 years in the past and we can even wonder, was even God with me? But when you dissect your life, you can look back and say, at that point, at that moment, God did something that I couldn't do by myself. But yet, our kids talk to us. Our families talk to us. And they ask a question, and we give very general answers because we don't remember the past. We just, yeah, something happened when I was 19, when I was 25, but we need to, be able to open up our book, our journal, and say, let me read something to you. And reading a journal about something that God has done for you to your kids shows you and them that God is real here. And as we've said many times, and as that chapter in in, uh, Joshua chapter 24 says, today for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. How is your house going to serve the Lord? They are going to serve the Lord because you serve the Lord. They're going to serve the Lord because they see that God is real within your life. Sometimes God gives us instructions to prepare us for the future. There's a TV show that I guarantee you probably 90% of the audience here has seen, and many of you liked it, many of you didn't. If I say one word, tell me what movie I'm talking about. Wax on, wax off. Paint the fence. Danielson. Why did Mr. Miyagi have Danielson paint the fence? Is it because the fence needed to be painted? Why did he have him wax wax, and wash all the cars? Because they were all dirty? No. Mr. Miyagi had Danielson paint the fence and wash and wax the cars because it was preparing him for karate before he even knew he was going to fight. And that's exactly what God does in our life. We are doing things, preparing things now that we have no idea God is moving and making us paint the fence, wax the cars, do certain things, sand the floor. He is preparing us now for the battle that we're going to have tomorrow. But if we take shortcuts today, if we get lazy today, If we say, Mr. Miyagi, I am not going to do it. I am tired. Mr. Miyagi would say, okay, go home. But if we quit in the midst of the preparation, God will never have victory in the midst of the battle because he can only rely on people that are willing to put in the time, the training, and the discipline. We just need to obey what God has called them to do. When Joshua told these 12 tribes, I need you to pick up a stone. It's not a pebble. Pick up a stone and carry it across the Jordan and place it at camp. They didn't say, dude, come on, Joshua. Can I, can I, I don't want to do this. They didn't question. They didn't argue. They just said, okay. He picked 12 men out of the 12 tribes. And he said, I need you to carry this stone. And the last time the Israelites picked 12 men, it was to spy out the land. 10 came back with a report, we should do it. But it was, oh, too hard. I'm scared. But two said, we're not only going to do it, we should do it. We can have victory in it. Caleb and Joshua gave the report of victory. But now these 12 men, they didn't have a choice. Joshua said, I need you to carry it. I need you to put it upon camp, and we're going to mark on it that whenever somebody sees these stones and they have questions, that God delivered me. God delivered me. Has there a point in your life where you can say, God delivered me? I had a Jericho that was so large, 
that God delivered me. I couldn't do it on my own. God showed up. He showed up in such a miraculous way that I am humbled that God could do such a great thing. And this next point is what uh, Justin just sang about. God deployed his angelic army. <laughs> this is awesome. That God deployed his angelic army. Joshua chapter 5. I'm going to read a few verses and, and then go around a little bit. In Joshua chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. On the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camped at Gilgal, on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. The day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. The manna stopped the day after they ate the food for the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites, but from that year, they ate of the produce of Cana. For 40 years, God has fed them, protected them, guided them, did everything for them until this day. This day, the manna stopped. They started eating some grain and some produce from this beautiful city. Now, verses 13. Now, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up and asked, are you for us or are you for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down on the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does the Lord have for his servant? And the commander of the Lord replied, take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. What happened a little over 40 years before? Moses was out tending his father-in-law's herd and a burning bush. Moses walks up to the burning bush and out of that voice says, stop. Where you're standing is holy ground. This is a picture of exactly what Christ has done for us. It's a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus. Jesus is the captain of the army of the Lord. When Joshua saw this man with a drawn sword, he saw power. And he fell on his face before him because this was God. The power. It wasn't just an angel. Because angels cannot and will not accept the worship of any person. John tried to worship an angel, and the angel said, no, that is only for God. Angels will not accept the worship of individuals. Jesus, when you see Jesus face to face with God, we will bow our face before him, and we will worship his name. Joshua is out. The battle is getting close He's out looking at Jericho and trying to figure out what he needed to do and how many archers he had to have and how many catapults he'd have to have and battering rams he'd have to have, how he was going to get into this fortified city. And Jericho was the largest city of its day. And Joshua was the general. He was the commander. He was in charge of everybody until he walked into the valley and he saw this man with a drawn sword. And here, the general, the president... So, hey, are you for us or are you for our enemies? And he said, listen, dude, I'm not for you or I'm not for them. I am me. I am going to win. I am here to take over. Joshua, being the general, being the president, he bowed his face before him and he said, what would you have me to do? What would you have me to do? Sometimes we just have to understand that God is going to do great things. I remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar looks up. Didn't we throw three men into the fire? There's a fourth man walking, and he is like the very Son of God. We can see that Jesus comes to this earth, sometimes in a, in a, in a state that we can see his presence. God spoke to Moses. God speaks to Joshua. And the presence that they have is holiness. 
His presence that they have is meekness. The armies of the Lord, the angelic hosts, we see in our finite minds. We see in this dimension. We see what we think we can see. But we, as spiritual individuals, we have to understand there's a whole nother realm. It's a spiritual realm that we have to absolutely trust God for and understand him that we have angels. There are angels. Some are seen and some are unseen. Some are visible and some are not. But we do have to understand in um, 2 Kings, Elijah was uh, at his cottage. And the Syrian army was all around him and camped around him. Thousands of Syrian soldiers and camped around Elijah and they were wanting to put him to death. And Elijah's little servant saw, he came out and looked at the window and he, he saw the, 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 the flames of all the soldiers and the weaponry glistening off the sun. He got fearful. He, got, he said, Elijah, Elijah, look, what are we gonna do? Elijah looks at, at the window and he says, wow, it's awesome. And the servant boy said, we're going to die. Elijah, what are you talking about? There's more out there for us than for them. Elijah sees the spiritual and the host of God's army was encamped around him to protect him. If we ever get to the mindset that I can do things for God because I'm not doing things for myself, that God is standing in front of me, and I humbly say, God, I need your protection and your help, we can stand firmly in the face of our adversity and say, I may not be able to do this myself, but I know that the angelic realm is in front of me, and I can pray for God's protection. And I can open up my spiritual eyes and see that even in this room today, and in your home at your house, and in your car, you have protectors. And it is a spiritual army that wants to stand in the gap for you and for me. I believe if we could take that spiritual armor and the armies that we have around us, and we could take a glimpse of what God has in store for us, we could say, you know what? I can stand and fight. I don't have to fail. I can do what God wants me to do because if I could see the spiritual realm and not just the physical, I would see God's hand, God's protection, and God's angels all around me. I can stand in the face of adversity. I can see there's greater and there's more for me than who is against me. And then the fourth thing is God directed the battle. God directed the battle. Joshua chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. Now Jericho was tightly shut up because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered into your hands. That's already a past tense. I have already delivered into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men, march around the city, one with all the men and its kings and the fighting men. March a second city around the city once, and all of them armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. And on the seventh day, march around that city seven times, and the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them, sound a long blast on the trumpets. Have all the people give a loud shout. Then all the wall of the city will collapse, and the people will go up, every man straight in. Every man straight in. Jericho, at this day, was the largest city of the known world. Had the highest fortified walls of 30 feet tall, 12 to 20 feet wide deep. Had two walls, and behind that wall was a 20-foot wall. So there was two captivating walls, and there were huts or houses within those walls. This was a very large, dominating city. It would say that on the seventh day, when they walked around it seven times, it would take from morning till dusk before they could get around that city seven times. It was a very massive city. It was so massive, the children of Israel knew it was impossible. 
But they have been trusting in God, and they saw that God delivered them out of the desert. They saw God deliver them across the Jordan. They watched God feed them, and they watched God do great things through them. And they heard their leader, Joshua, say, Consecrate yourselves, because tomorrow God is going to do great things. They had confidence because God had worked in the past. They have confidence that God is going to do this in the future. Now, what is your Jericho? The Jericho that you struggle with. The fortified walls that you hit your head against every day. Whether it is self-driven or whether it is motivated by somebody else's issue, whether it is an inner problem, a character problem, or a sin problem. Something that you have to battle. You have to battle on a daily basis. And sometimes we have to give some strict instructions on what we need to do. And God has given us those instructions. When we can look at our Jericho, and we march around that Jericho, and we can, need, we can see what we have to fight, we can look at that and we say, I cannot have victory. Many of you, many of us have struggled with many different things. I've talked to many people that have tried to quit smoking. How many of you guys have tried to quit smoking many, many times? And it's just hard to quit smoking. It's something that's a battle. And I tell people all the time, you got to be faithful. you got to be faithful. You just, you, I don't care if you have to quit 20 times. We've got to do it. You've got to have control of it. And they would say, Bruce, it is the hardest thing I've ever had to do is simply quit smoking. And I've never had a smoking problem. But I would say, you know what? That is your Jericho. That is your Jericho. It may be something else for someone else. It may be finances. It may be alcohol. It may be pornography. It may be all kinds of different issues. That is your Jericho. But what we have to do in order to have victory over our Jericho is we have to see it dead front in us, dead front in us and we have to see that we cannot have victory over it by ourselves and we have to claim it and we have to give it to God. We have to say, I need victory over this. I need to humble myself and say, I cannot have victory in this, but God, you can give me victory through this. And God can do great things among us when we do what? Consecrate ourselves. Purify ourselves. But listen, God's instructions, it's going to seem strange. It's going to seem strange. I don't think God has ever told us or you or this church to do something normal. I believe anytime God wants to do something great, it seems strange. It seems very difficult. And it seems very hard. Don't worry about the spears. Don't worry about the ammo. Don't worry about the batter in your rams. You don't need weaponry. What you need is me. That's what Joshua was told. And Joshua was looking at that. We cannot defeat Jericho without these weapons. God says, I am here to take over. I am here to do what I want to do. Your job is to follow what I ask you to do. And that's the second. The people obeyed precisely. They obeyed precisely. Do you want to have spiritual victory in your life? You need to do exactly what God has asked us to do. Being, listen to this, being ignorant is not a cop-out. Being ignorant about what God wants for you is not an excuse. God has given to us an example over and over again about what God's will for your life would be in very simple ways. We can stick our head in the sand and we can say we do not know. We can say as long as I don't look at it, as long as I don't address it, I don't have to deal with it. It is still sin. And God is going to punish those that sin even when they are ignorant about the sin. The Bible says to know it is sin and continue to do it, that is sin. What we must do is we must obey God's word precisely. Know what he wants and follow after him. And then God spared those who trusted in him. The walls of Jericho fell and the people rushed straight in and they took the city. But in that city, there was a young lady by the name of Rahab. 
And Rahab was a protector of the spies. And that thread that was hanging on her door said that nobody will harm you. And when God delivers the city, you will be safe in the midst of destruction. And in any area of our life, when there feels like there's issues going on, we feel like demolition is taking place, we feel like all the world is caving in on us, God always gives a way of escape. We have to have faith in him. We have to have trust in him. In every area, we have to trust that God works it out. Unbelief walks around and says, look how big the obstacle is. But faith looks at all the obstacles and say, look how big God is. In your Jericho, is your Jericho so big that it is clouding up your vision of God? Or is God so big, Jericho seems so small? In our issues, in our life, Jericho. It's our first battle. It's our first obstacle. And in the Israelites moving into the promised land, their first obstacle, they had to trust in God. If they didn't get through this obstacle, they'd have never had the next. And I know about this angelic army, the Lord, the captain of the host. I believe 40 years earlier, they were sitting there waiting to go. And if the Israelites would have crossed over Jordan 40 years ago, the battle of Jericho would have been there and the angelic army would have been there to fight for them then as he was for us today. You can never say, my time has passed. I should have done this. I should have done it 20 years ago. I should have done it 15 years ago. I should have done it last year. No, today is the day. Whatever obstacle, whatever Jericho that we have, we must stand and fight in the midst of adversity. If we do not, we will stand and fail. Or we could stand with God, with the captain of the Lord's host, and say, Lord, what would you want me to do? And the first thing Jesus says to Joshua is take off your sandals. It's not a go do, it's worship. Because where you're standing is holy ground. When you realize your victory is not in what we do, our victory is in who we worship. When we can take off our sandals and pray to God and say, Lord, I need your help. And Joshua did exactly what Jesus told him to do. And then he got the instructions how to defeat Jericho. But until we worship, until we realize that Jesus wants to take control, until we realize that where we are standing is holy ground, we will fight against Jericho our entire life. And we'll get tired of fighting it. And that stronghold will just be one place that we ignore and we'll start moving to something else and we'll never come back to the Jericho that God wants us to have victory in because we have lost and we're tired of it. So we'll move on from it. But that victory, until we can defeat Jericho, we will never have victory in other areas of our life. Take off your sandals because where you are standing is holy ground. And Joshua did exactly what he said. He worshiped him and then he got his instruction on how to defeat Jericho. Your Jericho and your instruction is going to be quite different than mine. I cannot give you instruction. Only God can. You don't worship anyone other than our Lord Jesus Christ. He died on the cross for your sins and he loves you. And whatever you're struggling with, give it to him. Worship him and see what he can do within your life. Let's go to Lord in prayer.